Good morning. Today is Tuesday, January 30th, 2024. It is uh, 10 a.m. And this is a meeting of Senate Map Resources and Energy. We're continuing our work on Bill S-213, an act relating to the regulation of wetlands, river corridor development, and dam safety. Um, we have uh, a draft bill that we've been working on, shared with uh, all interested parties, including the Agency of Natural Resources. Agency of Natural Resources has been working hard in the last week to develop a response. And so um, that's really what we're here to listen to this morning. So good morning, Secretary Moore. Thank you for coming back with your team. And the floor is yours. Great. Good morning. Um, so maybe just quickly go around and I can introduce who is here from ANR. I'm going to walk through um, a, a high level uh, set of recommendations regarding S213. Um, and then we have prepared draft language, but didn't do it as a red line breakout. And I think you'll get a sense as to why. Um, as I walk through the presentation, but I'm uh, joined this morning by what should be a host of familiar faces, uh, recognizing the extensive testimony your committee's always re already received. But uh, Ben Green, who's our chief dam safety engineer, Rebecca Pfeiffer, who manages the, our uh, flood hazard area program, Deputy Secretary Gendron, uh, Hannah Smith, who is in our legal services section and has been supporting this work, Rob Evans, who's the head of our rivers management program. I think you got everybody for me. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we, all, we know you're all busy, so thank you for all coming back so we can get as far into the weeds as we want or stay at 60,000 feet. I'm good at the 60,000 feet. Thanks, yeah. folks, can help with the week. Um, so, just reflecting back that to date, the, the testimony that the agency has provided regarding 213 has included uh, an overview of the conservation, restoration, and resilience efforts related to riparian areas, river corridors, wetlands, um, and floodplains that we have um, that we are currently engaged in, as well as regu regulatory programs from the National Flood Insurance Program um, to the recent updates to our wetlands rules, um, as well as the current rulemaking um, being undertaken by the Dam Safety Program. Um, and so the, we really believe that the efforts we currently have underway at AMR um, make unnecessary some of the proposed sections of 213, and we'll talk about those in a bit more detail here. Um, first, I'm going to start with the sections of the bill that pertain to wetlands, uh, then move into river corridors and floodways, um, and possible statewide floodplain standards, and then finish by addressing the pieces of 213 related to dam safety. Sure. Can I ask a high-level question uh, to yep. sort of get started? Uh, are we, it's almost like a worldview question, but we, the, I think part of the impetus for writing, drafting 213 was that there's an integrated natural resource, waterway, wetlands, uh, et cetera, we're having Increasing flooding problems, increasing amount of damage related to them. Um, and the sense was that we could use a, a more integrated, a comprehensive program, state led, to uh, manage those resources in a more effective manner. Is that, I don't want to be putting words in your mouth. I'm just trying to see if that's, that was the, I think, the place from which this bill, the, perspective from which the bill is tracked. Sure. And I guess I would offer that that the reason in, in having folks come before you with kind of the overview of what we're doing is I believe a lot of that work is taking place. Yeah. Um, it may feel like it, it flies a bit under the radar, um, but it is it is not because it's not being done. Many of those concerns, particularly around river corridors and wetlands, are integrated um, under our, the umbrella of our clean water work, um, but certainly all of the, the programs you're hearing from, um, with I guess the, the exception of the, the wetland restoration initiative being led out of Fish and Wildlife, all sit within DEC, um, and I would argue are, are well coordinated by the agents. Great. Uh, yeah, we, I, I'm confident that I know that there's much more going on at a and that I ever know about, yeah. even when we hear on your sure. um, and just before I jump in, though, I wanted to reiterate what I said when, when I was last in front of your committee, which is, is to be clear, the agency has no additional capacity to implement new ideas or programs 
uh, unless they are fully resourced. Um, I'm unbelievably proud of how staff have risen and risen and risen to meet the moment um, with either state or federal legislative mandates like the Global Warming Solutions Act, Environmental Justice Bill, Act 59 Conservation Bill, or the deploying the tens of millions of dollars in federal funding, um, as well as meeting the challenges in helping Vermont recover from recent flooding events. Uh, the staff in front of you here, as well as the more than 600 that are back in the office, do it without complaint and hope to serve Vermonters unbelievably well. Um, but our capacity is exhausted. Uh, the work in this bill is important. I'm going to give you a sense for where I see the priorities and what you've identified. Um, but make no mistake, what you've envisioned here is a massive undertaking. And in order for this to be successful, it must be appropriately resourced. And that includes both the time to do the work, uh, which I have some significant concerns about, as well as the capacity provided to the agency to support the work. Sure. And I'll, you know, for the record, um, you know, I want to say again that in, I've always said that um, this committee never wants to ask an existing staff to just stretch in yes. and work supposedly, I don't know, harder, uh, do more work, and that we we need to live up to our side of the bargain, which is providing the resources you need in order to succeed, because we don't, we write blueprints, we're not actually building anything, you're building stuff, and we need to provide that support. The issue I've seen, and uh, Call it my own shortcoming is to be slow to learn how we can genuinely work with you on a program funded in this room. And then when that appropriation competes with all the other appropriations competing for dollars in the budget, trim cuts can be made. And then we don't adjust what we've asked you to do. And so I'm working with the pro M and the chair of the post to find a remedy because a lot of those changes happen in the final week of the sessions and we don't really have a way to true things back up again. And I don't want to fall into that trap because it's as it, essentially it's unfair to operate here and stack that in. Yes. Thank you. Um, so as I noted, starting with wetlands, uh, Probably at the highest level, just want to note that we agree that better mapping is crucial for wetlands management. We know that it helps developers and landowners understand where wetlands exist um, and do the upfront planning needed to effectively avoid wetlands and also uh, integral to our ability to prioritize wetland restoration efforts. Um, we aligned with the goal of the bill, which is a net gain of wetlands um, and would indicate that or reflect back to you a net gain of wetlands is already occurring at the landscape scale as a result of that significant fish and wildlife uh, led restoration efforts. Um, and we would not support or do not support uh, changes to the wetlands permitting program right now uh, that are contemplated in the bill. Um, in terms of, of considerations to put out there for you and the way the bill is drafted, uh, wetlands are a water resource. And so I'm unsure, I guess, what the intent was in, in separating them or making a distinction between water resources and wetlands, but that is something we think would, would cause more confusion and harm than good. Um, I have a nice figure that shows a little bit about where we are with mapping currently. I believe Laura Lockyer may have shared this with you previously when she is in, uh, but we are on track to complete updated national wetlands inventory quality maps for the entire state of the Vermont by 2025. Um, this is using resources, a combination of one-time and base money that was appropriated to the agency starting, I believe, in FY21. Um, but we are at this point have, have sort of worked the kinks out, which is why we started with the Missisquoi River Basin, um, moved on to this partial mapping of the Lamoille River Basin, and now we'll begin in earnest uh, reflecting the lessons we learned in those initial mapping efforts. Um, there was also changes proposed in 213 related to our current noticing practices um, and specifically required newspaper notices and town clerk notice. This is significant additional cost and effort, um, and we believe for minimal benefit. Um, and so just would, would caution against that. 
Um, and then finally, there are some reporting requirements in the bill, um, and we just ask that efforts be made to align whatever reporting you land on with the reporting we're already doing to EPA in terms of, of timing um, and in terms of, of substance to the extent possible. So and I will summarize at the end kind of what, what we see as the resources that are necessary to support this work, um, but to comply with S213 is drafted. We believe it would take five additional FTEs to implement the wetlands pieces. This is uh, two staff for ongoing mapping and reporting obligations, and then three staff uh, to work on the permitting and long-term compensation piece. Um, and that's because while there's value to on-site compensation and restoration of wetlands near where the impacts occur, this approach is much more labor intensive um, than the, the current approach we use, the in-loop fee mitigation, uh, expensive and can be hard to find parties interested in serving as long-term stewards. Um, our, my recommendation to you would be to the extent you are interested in investing in further wetlands conservation, um, I would look to expand the work being done by Fish and Wildlife right now, uh, which is largely focused in the Champlain Basin by virtue of the fact that the lion's share of the resources we are using for that work come from the Lake Champlain Basin program and therefore are geographically limited to that part of the state. Um, let's see, I think I touched on most of these points. Um, and I guess I just conclude by saying that, that of the efforts contained in this bill, this one is a lower priority for the agency. Um, I will touch on the things that I see as a higher priority, um, but to the extent you have to, to make choices, um, I would go to other sections of this bill first. And the program just asked me to let all of you know uh, that they will be in the card room later this week to celebrate World Wetlands Day. Um, and would love to have you stop by and talk for it. Okay, great. We're having a party here. Um, World Wetland Day. Excellent. <laughs> you know that does that the uh, um, that sort of public event reminds me to check back in and I'll just put a bookmark into it. When we were talking about uh, rivers and how rivers behave, we heard and, um, enticing stories about the water table and um, well. The, Follow and see if there's a way to bring it to the for doing things. Those flume? Yeah, well, Mr. Bull, well, there's many ones now too. I was mm -hmm. very back then, but yeah, yeah. yeah. Frank Lewandowski River has one. Yeah, we are yeah. bringing one from the well. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> there we go. Thanks. Thank you. Thank like our in resident flume expert, our river expert. So. We have one from Montreal Museum and B. Um. I don't think that they've done the flume demonstration there. That might have done the two rivers, natural risk conservation district, or been the, probably not friends of the excuse the entire, but I'd imagine it might be two rivers that they But there are tables around and okay. we would love to bring one in if it's yes. not already in route. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yes. It's been a while since there's been a flume in the States. No. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> 10 o'clock. You said some of the work envisioned in the bill that we're so the bill assigns to your shop, we would do better to try to be fish wildlife. Well, that's also my shop. The, okay. That's it. No, 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 fish wildlife is, is in your. Correct. But you don't want it. So this, this is like emphasizing kind of the, the, the regulatory programs, right? And yeah. we have a, we permit um, some amount, modest amount of wetland filling every year, usually on the order of one to five acres of wetlands are lost um, through permits issued by DEC. On the other hand, Fish and Wildlife through the Clean Water Funding and Basin Program Funding is in restoring an average of about 100 acres a year. And what I'm saying is the um, sort of framework envisioned by this bill is labor intensive and expensive. And to the extent there's resources committed to this work, I think the impact would be far greater if they were combined with the existing like in fish and wildlife or wetland well conservation. Like they're doing the work already anyway. They are, but it, it's heavily biased towards the Lake Champlain Basin because most of the funding we are able to access for that work comes from 
uh, the relation of the I'm guessing whether constituent context may have had something I don't want to put the time and energy into. I think I say, well, Senator White is really important. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is all, all me. So <laughs> I am, I am. <laughs> And I forget the number, maybe you know it. It's something like 146 towns are in the Lake Champlain. Yeah, it's state. about half the state. Um, and and so and the the it's also the Lake Champlain flyway, so there's some real habitat components. No. The the initial concept for that restoration effort was it brought together clean water funding, as well as some of the habitat dollars we have access to. Um, but, you know, that doesn't mean there aren't great wetland restoration opportunities elsewhere in the state. We've just been opportunistic in what we've done today. Um, how much of Vermont turns into Old Champlain and how much into the Connecticut? It's roughly half and half. There's a small portion that goes to Lake Memphremagog and a small corner, northeast corner, yeah. I mean, the west was yeah, I'm sorry, southwest and mm -hmm. southeast. But yes, it goes into the, the Batten Kill and the Hudson. I think it's uh more than 45% of the state goes into Lake Champlain. Okay. It's not like Connecticut watershed is nothing. No, it, it is it got the well over 40% of the yeah. state. Yeah. You do we're I am just trying to let people know that when we say the Lake Champlain Basin, it doesn't mean Chidney County. No, no, it, it, it absolutely doesn't, but it but it's a geographic area program and um federal the, those federal dollars have to stay within that geographic area. Uh, so moving on to the state blood hazard state blood hazard area standards. Um, as drafted, the expansion of the flood hazard area rule would effectively flip the responsibility for the regulation of all land use. Uh, within the FEMA flood hazard area in the 274 communities that currently participate in the National Flood Insurance Program to the state. Um, this is will be a really significant undertaking. It is not just for new development, um, but would include modifications to existing uh, buildings, including repairs to any facility taking flood damage. Our best estimate is this is about 210,000 acres of land and 12,400 structures that are located in or immediately adjacent to these mapped flood hazard areas. Um, and just so we're all clear, the trigger for what, what constitutes development is any human-made change to improved or unimproved real estate. So permitting would be required for development at any scale on those 210,000 acres. Um, uh, thank you, Chair Brian. Um, this is an important piece to me, and I understand what you're saying, that this is a big change. And I don't think that that's unknown to the committee. It is a very big change. Um, however, big change is required often when we have major natural disasters that continue to escalate. I'm wondering if you could just, because I haven't heard a good case yet, so I'd love to know what the good case is. Why should our small communities and volunteers be doing this, and are they doing it effectively? So I think there are, there's a, a regional component too. I know that there is. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there are, there's absolutely a way to better support our small communities. I, I think there are challenges in that system and there would be enormous challenges in a, a state level approach. Um, they do it, like, are they doing it well now though? Like I'd love to, I haven't heard that yet. So I'm trying to, if it is true, I want to- they, they are meeting the obligations necessary for them to continue to participate in the National Flood Insurance Program. So be, I, don't, I don't know what your definition of well is. Uh, to my mind, and we refer to Rebecca here, folks were, communities were being exited from the flood insurance program, meaning community members could no longer access flood insurance. That would be a sign of abject failure. That is not happening. Right. And so beyond that, I think it's a little, the definition of well is a little bit more subjective. Is it labor intensive? Yes. Um, and so what we're proposing as an alternative here is to develop a statewide flood hazard area standard. It would be consistent. Right now, um, most, if not all of those communities have their own uh, flood yeah. hazard area standard. And so to the extent the agency provides a clear set of standards that are implemented across the state, 
that are consistent with what's required by the National Flood Insurance Program. It allows us to provide better technical assistance, training, um, and support to, to, to communities in a way that we can't right now. So, okay. I, I appreciate you taking the time to respond to that. Do you, but I don't, I don't think I'm quite understanding your response, which is to put a consistent standard would open up the ability for you to offer technical support as a state. Correct. So, but you don't need more staffing to help. Oh no, we, we'll get there. Okay, great. <laughs> well, all of this requires resources. Okay. And some of it requires far more resources. And what would you say to a town that potentially this would go into effect for? Who is, you know, we've had towns come to us and say, this is not, this system is not work for us on a lot of just fundamental, we are on a river at a different point than the town above us. Yeah. <laughs> so we don't think about them the same way. Um, so how would that stand? So the, to be clear, this isn't river corridors. This is flood hazard areas. Sure. And we need to, to separate, I think, those, those two concepts. This is okay. fundamentally about the regulation of improvements to develop and undeveloped land. This is about which, building. Which can have implications. It, it can, but there are other communities. Correct. Um, yes. Okay. So what would you tell a town that, what would you say if we do your plan, what would you tell a town is the improvement for this? That there, I'll have to make that the there will be the templates and technical assistance and tools made available to them to support their work in this space, as well as training as they bring on new people responsible for administering flood hazard area standards in their community in a way that we can't provide right now because everyone is different. If, if I may, so, um, you know, and I need to recognize from the state national flood insurance program coordinator, coordinator and I manage our flood hazard program. Um, I think some of the questions that I can be asking is, this is really hard for towns to do. It yes. is. Um, back when our office was originally developed in the 70s or so, I'm guessing, the state statute, we were, towns are required to submit um, proposals for development um, to our office for review before they can issue a local flood hazard permit. I think the intention was to help provide the technical assistance that you're yeah. speaking to, and we do that enough. We issue, you know, 40, 60, 70 of those a year to different communities that submit them to us. So I think part of what the secretary is speaking about is that we are spread so thin. Yes. Trying to provide that support, especially in post-disaster situation where we're helping them to meet their post-disaster obligations. One of the things that makes it difficult is that every single town has different standards. So before you have any conversation with a landowner, with the town, we're having to open up to see what do they have, how's it different. I think the benefit of a statewide flood hazard standard is that there's that consistency. So the yeah. town next to each other, you know, there are different points in the watershed. If all the towns had a higher standard from a starting point that are, is more protective of the floodplain, we're trying to reduce those impacts that go downstream. Mm -hmm. That consistency of regulation also allows us to provide tools and so that towns could potentially in the proposal have a higher standard, but we know the starting place. Um, and so we can, we spend a lot of time doing a lot of basic local yes. land use zoning. So some of our time is spent talking about floodplain development, but a lot of our time is like spoken to like speaking to the town. How do you issue a permit? Yeah. You know, this is your, this is how you issue a permit yeah. to warn if you're, you need to form a floodplain award. So, um, you know, under, a, under a DRB type of format. And so, um, this I think can help us provide more of those basic supports. Yeah. Because we have like a, a level starting place. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I think I really appreciate your response, and I'll stop asking questions mm -hmm. at this point on this topic. But I do think it is a harder lift to ask tiny towns to do this and to build a structure in that direction than it would be to ask the state, which is kind of functioning as a county, as most other places experience it. So I appreciate your response, and thank you so much, Ms. Pfeiffer. That was very helpful. Thank you. Um, is in in having a statewide uh, standard, does that I I hear that it would raise the 
the standards for a lot of towns. Are there places where that would actually, because it's state law, would it actually lower the standard? It's intended to be a floor, right? Not a ceiling. So, so, so to the extent, probably the best example I heard now, remember if I came from Robert Rebecca was following uh, the 2011 flooding along Lake Champlain shorelines, um, several lake communities. I think we advocate for two feet base flood, above base flood elevation. They wanted to go more because obviously they'd seen three. Um, our intention is not to say to those communities, no, you can only have a two foot elevation, but it, it is intended to create this consistent framework or foundation that all, all of the local regulations are built on. So I'm not necessarily against this idea, um, but with that, I worry that we're not actually getting the standardization, that, it, that it's gonna to continue to be a lot of work because you're still gonna to have to look into like, well, what does this town do? Is this the standard or is this more? Um, if I may. Um, so with currently we have probably about 10% of our towns that have a standard that is equal to our state floodplain rule okay. or may exceed that. So 80, 90 towns or so. Okay. If if we are going to some level of rulemaking for a proposal for a statewide minimum floodplain standard, some of those rules or some of those towns standards are what may potentially be contained in the rule. And so we may be needing, so the handful of towns that may have rules that exceed what a state rule might be, I think would be relatively small. And I think in those towns, they are towns that we've been working with for years because they have higher state requirements. So we kind of already know yeah. when I step into this town, I already know they don't allow new structures and we fill over budget period. Yeah. Okay. So it'll be, even though there may be some exceptions, it'll be more manageable. I think so. That is neat. <laughs> yeah. So I'm um, hearing basically you're interested in having a statewide standard, but not doing the regulatory piece behind it. Correct. Okay. It would allow it to well, well, the standard get refined to state law. Correct. Exactly. That we would be able to provide those sort of administrative resources along with education and training uh, in support of a statewide standard in Hawaii region. Is it a mandatory adoption of the statewide standard? The, Yes. By a date certain. Correct. Correct. Do other things do it this way? Um, so what I found out, kind of eating the bushes, there's two states that have a state permit, Michigan and Kentucky, the couple of Kentucky. Um, there are several states, maybe seven or eight, that have higher standards in the floodway, which is a part of FEMA's floodplain. In Vermont, we have maybe less than 5% of towns that have matched floodways. So oh. it would be limited in where that potential higher standard could apply. Um, and then there's many states that have adopted the International Building Code, which if they adopt the full code, there are higher floodplain standards, but they're relatively minimal, like extra freeboard, like a foot of freeboard. Um, but they're not, um, it's more about like protection of building and buildings. And most states do it as the towns do the permitting and the state sets standard. Yeah, and I think some of the, um, even in, I can't speak to Michigan, I know in the Commonwealth of Kentucky that they <laughs> issue a state permit, but the towns also issue permits. And part of the intricacy of this is that each town joins the National Flood Insurance Program as separate entities. So the town of Bethel joins the flood insurance program, like the town, the city of Montpelier. So I think that there would we as a state are our community, but if we were to take over permitting, I think there would still be like the town would still need to issue permits because they are the individual entities that participate in FEMA's national flood insurance program. So to make to make them eligible for flood insurance in their community each town would still be issuing a permit. And so there would still there would be redundancy, I think, if there was some sort of a state program where we're issuing a permit, then they would still have to issue a local permit. Um, Secretary, so I just want to do sort of a time check. I don't know how long the deck is, and I don't want us to rush. I also don't want us to get too far in the weeds and not secure your full presentation. So. Thank you. Probably should keep moving. Um, I just would reflect that that as drafted, uh, we project S two thirteen would take uh, twenty new staff people within that agency, uh, whereas this this modified approach could be accomplished with far fewer 
Senator Bray, you'd asked a little bit about a, a proposed timeline for how this work would be accomplished. Um, and this is this is what we think is is reasonable uh, that we could start the the outreach and consultation that would be needed with municipalities and RPCs who are really an important partner in this work to develop that set of recommended statewide standards. Um, we're assuming the bill will be effective July first, and then with the the goal of moving into rulemaking uh, about through the rulemaking process in in twenty twenty five. And then uh, starting the work in, in early 26 needed to update bylaws. And we would um, prioritize this based on planned FEMA map updates um, that are scheduled to, to occur statewide um, starting in, in early 26 and being completed in 27. Um, and so that, that timing makes a lot of sense and that folks are going to need to get into their uh, their NFIP uh, or their bylaws anyways, and so we can take advantage of, of that moment of time. The rule thing was, I think, six months long, um, which seems brisk. But well, it, it's um, intended that we're going to do 12 months of sort of pre-rulemaking yeah. stakeholder engagement. That engagement process. Correct. If you may be that, that is our preferred approach is to try to deal with deal with as many of the concerns before we get into formal rulemaking as, as possible. Okay, great, thanks. All right, um, then in terms of the expanded river corridor uh, regulation, want to start by recognizing the critical importance of, of river corridors, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and that expanding jurisdiction over river corridors, we believe, really requires significant upfront public engagement and a, a much longer term effort that's envisioned here um, as part of the flood hazard area regulation or uh, as S13 is currently drafted. Um, it, it would require currently it would require us to regulate all mapped river corridors as I flag that's just about 210,000 acres of land. That's five times the area that's regulated by the shoreland encroachment permit, which is a, a staff of four. Um, and obviously, before we entered into shoreland encroachment, we did a, a shared roadshow with the legislature, went out and met with communities, heard feedback, but frankly raised awareness that these rules were going to be put into place. Um, obviously, this will affect an inordinate number of landowners and absent a really thoughtful upfront public engagement process, it is likely to result in a series of compliance related concerns that are no fun for anyone. A um, road show sounds more fun than I remember it. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, so we would propose to, to phase this work. Uh, the first phase being mapping. Um, so looking at, in particular, infill areas for dense uh, dense development, uh, sort of taking into account our existing settlement patterns, um, and then designing a, a river corridor map amendment and revision process. Um, next would come education and outreach once we have the maps, to work with the public to understand the maps, and then finally, um, moving into a, a rulemaking process and recognize this is a longer timeline than the, the committee had envisioned. That said, uh, I think it is essential to our success to have that kind of um, longer runway uh, leading up to this work. Do you, want to... uh, do you have any work that your team has done to, I know predict is not the right word, but to consider how many floods will happen within that time frame? I mean, I know it's in, I, I don't know, do you, I mean, we kind of saw some of the hurricane increase coming with like raising of water temperatures. Do you have, how many do you think, or how many does the agency expect will happen before 2030? I think that is an, an unknowable question. Uh, certainly the National Climate Assessment makes predictions in terms of the increase in frequency of events, but the chance of an event occurring in any, in any particular year is, is simply a probability. I don't, I don't think. Do you, do you have any, what would the, what did they say the probability is? I'm happy to share that information that would, with you. That'd be great. Like in the morning year? I don't know. I, I believe in the slide that um, Dr. Dupini Giroux presented yesterday to the Climate Council, she indicated that it's somewhere between one and two events per year. 
Okay. Um, and I think, and have Rob correct me if I'm wrong, but we've had 40 ish uh, federally declared flood disasters in Vermont since the last 1990. So there's at least one year. I mean, this, this is this is not to diminish um, the risk associated with flooding. This is being realistic about how we can be successful with this work. Yeah, we heard the disaster atlas, folks, and that was pretty concerning. Thank you. Um, so as I noted, uh, to comply with 213 as drafted, uh, we believe we would require about 20 additional FTEs uh, to assume this responsibility for municipal land use regulation. Uh, we have done some initial outreach to VLCT, both about the bill, but then specifically our statewide flood hazard area standards approach. Um, and I, if you have not heard from them already, I think you should. They expressed some concerns um, about that, how that intersection sits between the state and local regulation. Um, to implement the alternative approach suggested by a and uh, we would need two additional FTEs to support the statewide flood hazard area standards. So this is really that technical assistance and capacity we would bring to bear for municipalities and immediately two FTEs to support and coordinate um, the river corridor mapping and contract consultants. We would need additional employees beyond that once a permitting program uh, came to, to pass them. Um, mm -hmm. And we're proposing 2030. And at the end, I have a summary of all of these requirements. Sure, thank you. Um, the, so there's a lot of <clears throat> different sorts of mapping going on. Are they, um, I don't know to what degree they're complementary or the, the same team can sort of roll from the focus on wetlands or hazard areas for river corridors, you know, like, Please. So we are, we've, we contract, mapping, so. we've contracted for the wetlands mapping, um, and that's a, a particularized expertise. I would look to Rob to speak. I think we have to, con the way we've shown it in our, the budget you'll see at the end, so we're proposing to contract for those services. I don't know if there's an alternative to hire staff to do that directly. Um, but there's capacity needed yeah. to do that mapping that doesn't currently exist. I'm happy to put a little bit of a finer point in it. So for the record, Rob Evans, Rivers Program. Um, the good news is we now have a statewide river corridor map you know, that we developed in-house after Irene. It took us seven years to do it, um, four years to create the first version, then additional years to, to, to refine the map with our field data. So we have that map. Um, there's the mapping around infill areas you've heard about um, that will take time, but our existing GIS specialist that, that manages our river corridor map is maxed out right now with, with modifications to the map that come from regulatory reviews. Um, and a huge part of the mapping really has to do ahead of a new regulatory program. With people understanding um, what it takes to challenge the map, as I said, I think previously in testimony, once you put lines on a map that tell you where you can and can't build, people want to challenge those lines. Yeah. Those lines also get challenged in the compliance and enforcement context as well. And it's it's vastly different than challenging the FEMA map. The type of geomorphic assessment data and analysis that you need to submit to us to review and consider we may re refine the map, we may not. And I think there's a big misconception, perception out there that, that you could modify the map and cut it down by half. Um, if there's a bedrock gorge, perhaps yes, but more often than not, after a lot of back and forth with consultants and education, you might contract the map by 14 feet on each side, or we might look at it and say, oh, thanks, you just showed us that this river is more sensitive and it needs to be wider than what we have this map. So, Landowners need to be aware of that reality, and our, 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 our engineering and environmental consultants that do this work really need to be aware of that reality. So that's the real the foundational work that needs to happen um, in building out a map amendment revision process and making sure everybody knows what lies in front of us. So, and When you're doing wetlands mapping now, you, I'm guessing you occasionally run into a similar thing, but if, you, if people look at a piece of property that they regard it as unencumbered in any way now. Turns out there's a wetland there. Um, so is that experience around without maps and challenging maps totally been piecemeal so far? Or 
or you know so right now and so it's a great question because it leads to another important point that needs to be made right now we give everybody the benefit of the doubt if somebody want, proposes whether it's through local river corridor regulation or act 250 or through our rule that's those patchwork of jurisdictions that we support if somebody's proposing to develop um in a river corridor the first thing we do is send out one of our river scientists to to get their boots on the ground and make sure we have the map right. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes we'll get out there and go, oh, there's red, there's ledge, there's bedrock, there's confining features here, we should modify the river corridor. Or no, we've got the map right. Um, you can do additional analysis with the consultant and we can tell them what that scope of work looks like. That is that is retail level um, resource intensive work we provide. Um, and again, that happens also in the compliance enforcement context. And I think we need to flip to a different model where we have a robust map amendment revision process where there's an application and there's a fee we charge for our services because of the time that goes into that. And again, maybe we reduce the number of challenges because people understand that it's a big deal to change the portal map. Thank you. Uh, ready for me to move on to dance? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. All uh, right. Um, so as, as this committee knows, the dam safety program is undergoing phase two of the dam safety rulemaking process and remains on track for July of 2025. Um, and it is our priority to complete that rulemaking process before um, legislating on anticipated outcomes of the rule. And so the 213 as drafted gets ahead of our rulemaking process a bit. Um, there is a piece of it that would love to, to, to work on uh, with the committee, which is building out the formation of a revolving loan fund to provide critical funding for not just removal, but reconstruction and repair, um, where there is need to reduce risks to public safety. Um, the governor's FY25 budget does include a million dollars um, to create a pilot of this revolving loan fund program. Um, a couple other flags that I would leave with the committee. Uh, 213 as drafted makes reference to DEC taking jurisdiction over what are currently PUC regulated dams. Um, there, that transfer of jurisdiction needs to be clarified in statute. And we believe as drafted, it may actually have both of us regulating the same portfolio, uh, which would be problematic. Um, and we uh, agree with the broad strokes that that, that transition should happen. Um, but not on the timeline prescribed in the bill. Uh, we are in favor of 2028, recognizing that may be too far out for some. That said, uh, there is an opportunity to have FERC review and potentially take over uh, oversight of some of these facilities, and we would like to leave time for that process to happen before ANR would assume jurisdiction over the rest. Um, and then finally, we just flagged knowing the committee spent considerable time on it. We don't have a position on the section of the bill that addresses liability as it does not intersect with our regulatory authority. In terms of our planned schedule, uh, we are it, sort of in this draft rulemaking and public con comment community engagement process around phase two. Um, and anticipating bringing the rules to LCAR in the first half of next year. And as I indicated, uh, adopting those rules by July of next year. So um, in terms of, there are a couple of pieces in the governor's budget related to the dam safety program, that million dollars that I flagged to, to provide initial, cap, initial capital for a revolving loan fund. And then there are two uh, what are currently limited service positions within uh, Ben's team, and it would transition both of those to permanent status. Um, the committee had previously asked for some raw cost ranges related to dam assessment, design permitting, and construction. Um, and these are figures that Ben provided and would defer any questions you might have on them. But the bottom line is there is an ongoing investment needed of somewhere between two and four and a half million dollars a year. Thanks. In the high hazard and finding, are any of those in poor condition? Or I forget, sorry, I'm, I'm not remembering the classification part, but there's poor condition and then there's something above it that's 
Less than four, but not not um, entirely reassuring. <laughs> so I'm uh, uh, Levan Green, uh, I'm just a second chief EMT engineer for the record. Um, of the high hazard potential dams we have, which the high hazard potential dam is one that in the event of a failure or incident, there's all the probable loss of life. Um, we do have, I believe, nine of those dams are poor condition. The one condition rating works in that is unsatisfactory, which means essentially immediate action is needed. And the we are working not to have any high hazard dam with them situated unsatisfactory this time. <laughs> so, sorry, did you say none of them are? None of the nine are poor, and none of them are unsatisfactory. No, there, there are nine poor conditions, but yeah. none, are, none, are, none are unsatisfactory, which is, 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 is considered a worse condition than poor. Unsatisfactory essentially means that we need to take the immediate action needs to be taken. Okay. Um, so, John, if it's rated unsatisfactory, you don't have to spend the money to fix it. Is that what we're saying? Well, if it's rated unsatisfactory, we need to spend the money to either fix it or remove it. Right away. Immediate So if we call it, say it's satisfactory, then you don't have to spend it. So the condition ratings are satisfactory, fair, poor, and unsatisfactory. Uh, the satisfactory condition dam would be one that, in a broad sense, meets all the regulatory criteria and, and design standards. And is in you know, good operating conditions, expects to perform well under all all you know potential flood events or, or loading conditions the dam may have. And then you know a fair condition dam is one that has some. Uh, likely unknowns associated with performance or some lingering issues. And then uh, a poor, poor condition dam is one that either has a lot of unknowns or um, it concerns about performance under certain loading conditions. An unsatisfactory dam is one that we're, consider, um, we're concerned about the condition but under the current loading condition. Uh, and we essentially need the actions needed. Jim McCormick. Forgive me for temporarily narrowing my focus from the whole state to my own particular mm -hmm. constituents. We were a little startled to see uh, Silver Lake and Garner yeah. at the top of the list. Mm -hmm. um, uh, am I assured that there's no reason to think that Lo Locust Creek is going to come storming down that valley? And, uh... <laughs> so that's an example of a high hazard potential dam that's rated in poor condition largely because it fails to meet um, the design standard requirement for the for to, uh, safe passage of a large flood event. So. Um, under normal condition, you know, the dam is in, in, in decent condition. However, uh, for a dam of a high hazard uh, rating, you have to meet a certain regulatory size storm event, which for a high hazard dam is a very large storm event called a probable maximum flood. And that, that dam does not feel to meet it without overtopping or having a, uh, failing to properly control that size flood. So that's by and large one of the reasons why that, that dam is rated in poor condition. I, I, I respect that certain terms <clears throat> have particular meanings under certain circumstances under the law. A lot of people get angry with me when I think that way and I say, no, this, this is, I think we have to be clear on what it means. But in the vernacular, high, High risk, is that or high, high, hazard. high hazard? High hazard. That's a scary yeah. term. Yeah. In the I, vernacular. I know. And I'm not, I mean, we capitalize it to try to make it clear it's a categorization and appreciate that it also feels like we're yelling at you, right? High hazard. Well, yeah. <laughs> but it, it is, it's a categorization. And, and it, we do take it seriously. As Ben indicated, it, it means that were that facility to fail, there could be a loss of blood, right? So we have to have some way to organize. Um, and this is a, a national framework in terms of dam hazard classification, but I, I hear what you're you're saying. It it speaks it's speaking to kind of the worst possible outcome because of the size of the facility, not necessarily the imminent risk. The condition is more. Are you talking about the, 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 the geography of uh, the topography of the valley below the? Both that and how much water narrow and steep, and how much uh, water is stored behind the dam. The dam itself, to the layman's eyes, looks pretty solid. Uh, it has to do with the location of home. Again, it's, 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 it's hazard potential. So there's a potential under certain conditions. The dam does not meet all the standards, which means that it could have a fragility during a certain flood event that could cause an uncontrolled release downstream. And there are homes, you know, based on modeling that are would be within the zone that would be flooded uh, to a height that you know with less than fifty percent, better than fifty percent chance it wouldn't be survivable with someone living in that home. That that's the standard that. And that's because that the valley below Barnard, 
it is steep and now we're, we're correct and there are several homes that are near uh, near that valley you know, there are dams that when we talk about consequences there are high hazard dams that have uh, you know there's a term population at risk means number of people that are potentially within that flood inundation so that dam fail uh, high hazard dam you only need one potential loss of life to have a high hazard dam so you only need essentially one home or one road of certain classification in that flood zone to be a high hazard dam you also have dams like Waterbury Dam, where you're looking at lost life numbers in an area of thousands, should you have a similar event. So there is a range within each of the, so it's some, some almost oversimplification to the high significant low hazard classifications. Because um, they're, they're even within in, within that classification system, they're the gradient of, of, of consequence levels. So we're going to early reassured now. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Any questions on this one anymore? It's, yeah. Um, uh, so, and so to just follow up in that next category, significant hazard of 59 dams. Um, can you say something about, are any of those in unsatisfactory or poor condition? Yeah, all 59 of those are. This, this is just the poor condition. Oh, yeah, these are just poor conditions. And I do believe I have to check my notes, but I believe there are a, a small, uh, several of those that we're currently actually dealing with that are not great as unsatisfactory. Um, so when I, which is the total, I'll use the hot numbers. So it's 70 million. Uh, and we're talking about the uh, million into the revolving loan fund, and which feels like we're, we're not, I mean, I'm not, it's just the, the math. So how, how do we address 70 million potentially on the high end in need? Starting at one million dollar revolving so, loan fund. There must maybe there's other sources of funding for part of the challenge here is right now we we don't know if people will take us up on loans, yeah. right? What we have heard from dam owners is they don't have resources to invest um, and or have difficulty accessing capital. This calls the question. Now we have capital you can access. Does anyone sign up? Correct. And if not, then it, we may have to look at, at alternative solutions. But this is, to me, this is a, a proof of concept mm -hmm. that that's the feedback we've heard that folks don't have access to the capital needed to make the improvements. So let's see if we can create a revolving loan fund that works. Well, it's not to say we're fully capital, that this fully capitalizes the right. need, but it's a start. Um, right. It's only year one. So there's even if it's the same thing for a decade for us, which is better than yeah. I don't understand the issue here. Just because you happen to have money to build the dam or repair it, um that is on a you know mill pond dam where there are 25 or 30 or 40 houses, why would you do it? Well, yeah. Why would you repair the dam? Because there will be there, we are in the process of rulemaking that requires that work to be done. I'm, we're going to do that. I give you the dam before I come back. Well, and, and at times it does call the question, right, in terms of people removing dams rather than making investments in repairs and replacement. We're having a dis we're trying to make some decisions on what to do, and it has been suggested that well, if the folks had the money or could borrow it, everything would be okay. I don't. I okay. did not intend to suggest that. I'm saying that is one of the responses we've received to date, and this is an effort to see how real um, that lack of access to capital is in terms of folks' decision making. When you, you try and push solutions, there are all sorts of best solutions that you've had to date, and I, I would cross that one off the list. <laughs> we we got problems, or you're sharing with us that. Um, Things are going well enough, and that there aren't the resources to tackle the the, um, the issues out there that have yet to be I'm sorry, maybe I don't understand what you're saying. One of the ways to save money is to declare that it the, that things are under control and the dam is satisfactory. Yeah, I don't think there's any attempt here to sugarcoat the fact that we have some very significant needs 
um, in terms of the overall dam inventory of the state. The fact of the matter is most of these are privately owned. Um, and so not fully within the control of the agency outside regulatory authorities. And we're looking at ways to get the improvements made or to provide the so pressure. What are the lists of ways to get improvements made? If that's what you're looking at. <laughs> what are the lists of things we can do? That, that is the purpose of this revolving loan fund is to create access. I, have to do, I don't want to revolve anymore, but I'm going to give you the damn. What the, I'm skeptical that anyone will be unwise enough to invest in a revolving loan fund that's made available to them for something that they don't have to do. Except they do have to do it. Right now, it's it's just a matter of, frankly, in some instances, you can't get blood from a stone. If people don't have resources available to make the necessary improvements, they are unable to make the necessary improvements. Understood. So if they're not able to do that, what's the state's position on what we will do next before the, you know, if we're the, the summer coming up to mirror the one we've just had, what would the discussion be here today, a year from now? Ideally, that, that we have gone out to a number of these four condition dams, been able to put together a financing package and improvements are underway. But I, I think Senator McDonald's point is if they, the financing package we're talking about is the revolving loan fund. So what would happen in the instance that it is unlikely that someone would take that? So I think that's where our rules kick in ultimately okay. come summer of 25. Okay. Um, I haven't brought up the swamp that I have not mentioned. But most of the rule along. <laughs> um, that, so under current, I know you're in the midst of rule making. Is there an obligation under the current rule or the, the rule that's coming is going to be the one that makes it clear that you have an obligation to maintain the dams? And right now that's not clear or not asserted at all. I would defer to Ben helping us. Our, our current, so historically, the program has not had that authority. The, the phase one of the rule does clearly state the responsibilities of dam ownership and maintaining your dam in compliance with the rules. Phase two of the rule is all the technical standards for which the dam owners will have to meet. So we sort of need that part of the package to be able to fully compel owners to take action. Uh, in situations where you have a high hazard dam, it's in poor condition, and the condition continues to deteriorate, and that owner is not taking not not making not not investing improvements and, and things like that. Uh, you know, we'll start to look at all, other alternatives. They can drain the reservoir. That's still a temporary measure that, that at least reduces the uh, risk of all the flood conditions. Essentially, yeah. uh, but that's still going to be viewed as a, a temporary condition. They still have a dam. They still have to make a, a decision on a permanent fix of time, whether that be removal or or rehabilitation. Um, as far as an order decision, um, there's a lot of you know. People on all, all sides of the fence on, uh, on what the right thing to do is, but um, you know, at the end of the day, we, we need to at these facilities have a safe condition, whether that be a, a, re a rehabilitated dam that's up to standard or one that's not that's the permanent goal. We have one of those two solutions. Mm -hmm. um, and I was, I don't want to make light of um. The Windsor County delegations dam that is so your heightened concern. Your heightened concern. So not that we're doing it right here, but what's the best way if any member of the committee or anyone listening here, uh, on this particular committee, anyone in, in the committee has a, a concern about the particular dam, what's the best way to follow up and learn more uh, both about the, the details of the condition and the risk and state plans to if, if any so, that's a great question. Thank you. I think it would come to your team then. Correct. You have a reach out to the dance safety program. Um, can you can oh. discuss in the dance in our regulatory or ownership portfolio? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So we would email you. Yes. Okay. Did I understand correctly? The term high hazard has to do not with the likelihood of the dam failing, but with the consequences of a failure. If that. Correct. 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 So you can have an um, unsatisfactory condition dam that's high hazard or low hazard. The hazard potential has entirely to do with what is downstream of the dam should fail, regardless of the probability of failing. Okay. 
should I derive comfort from that regarding Barnard? Oh, I, the the dam looks pretty good to the layman's eyes. Right. I, I think <laughs> what, what Ben was saying is is the, the concern with that facility is during a, a major flood event, it could be overtopped and would have the release would occur in an uncontrolled fashion. And it's also a dam that we're actively in a, uh, um, in a comprehensive assessment of the dam to identify alternatives to address that issue and ultimately have that dam be in satisfactory condition. And we're you know, it's certainly the early steps of that, but we're, that dam is moving through the process in a, in a positive direction. Overtopped as opposed to dam class. Correct, correct. Yeah, it doesn't have the. Well, over overtopping and then eroding and then yeah. eventually yeah. having not control release. Okay, um, one other question. You know, we're, we're hurting the time. Um, again, being parochial, uh, there's a string of lakes in town, on the, mm -hmm. and uh, there, that's basically an old stream dammed up yeah. at various places. I've heard, I've gotten complaints from constituents down there that one of those dams is privately owned and the owner is not taking care of it, so that you have an entire lake of stream. In which everybody involved and the public is what what do we do with something like that? I assume I imagine maybe talking referencing the Amherst Lake. That's an example of a significant hazard dam where the condition continues to deteriorate. The private owner was not able to finance to take on a rehabilitation project at that time. So we had them actually lower temp temper level, lower the level several feet yeah. to reduce loading on the dam to theory buy time by reducing the risk temporarily to to make that uh you know, decision on what their next uh, moves were going to be. The dam was sent, you know, I guess sold for a dollar to a essentially a lake association who's trying to raise funds to restore the dam. Um, so that that got some positive forward movement, but um, yeah, that, that that is yeah, that's sort of the unfortunate consequence of dams. As many of them are, we were not privately owned. They impact you know people well beyond just the dam owner themselves. You know, the dam owner holds all the risk and liability. And you know, ultimately, you know, fiscally responsible for the facility, so it becomes a, a very large burden on a, a private person. The, the lake is a public asset, though. The lake upstream of the dam is, is a public asset, but the state doesn't can't force the owner to fix it. Rulemaking. Our, 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 and our rulemaking will be able to compel the owner to to. Uh, Either right. again repair or ultimately move, move to a permanently stable and safe condition, which is ultimately the direction we're heading is is this dam going to be removed or going to be restored and rehabilitated? Yeah. Uh, but I don't think we quite know the answer yet because they're still kind of working through. Looks like they're moving the rehabilitation route at this time, but I think that they're trying to raise funds. I think that's a challenge for that's that's I think one of the yeah. challenges there. If the money was in pocket, I think the construction project priority is done. Right. And I, I think that's an important point. We're sort of frankly, agnostic on uh, whether people repair or remove in most instances. And that is maybe a challenging conversation with other property owners around a particular water body. Um, but that Ben's team's interest is public safety um, as opposed to recreational access or, or other concerns that may arise in the future. Okay, I think I want to. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I like that we have at least a million dollars, hopefully, that we can put into this revolving loan fund. Just so you know how I'm thinking about this, I, I appreciate that it's a proof of concept. Will this actually motivate change? That's great. My head is already two, three years down the road. It doesn't matter whether or not it is a proof of concept because either it works, and so now we need a lot more money, or it doesn't work. And we need a lot more money, right? And so I, I'm thinking about like where, like what is the mechanism? How are we going to, because we, we need to, either it's this, either it's through the damn revolving loan fund or it's some other strictly like grant oriented um, tool. But either way, we need to generate a lot more funds. And I, and I realized, you know, like asking you like, what, what should that mechanism be right now is not, a useful question, but I just want you to know that like that's something that I'm thinking about, and you know I I, I think about the logic of uh, tying uh, costs to those who benefit from the service, and that's not a very 
that that would be a, a huge thing to say, you know, all the people downstream are benefiting. And so do they have a role to pay in, in paying for the upkeep of, let's say, like a flood control dam? Um, how, how that connection is made in terms of paying for a service, they don't know. I'm not even sure that's the right tool, and I, I I hesitate to even say it like on the record because I don't because I don't know if that's the right the right tool. But I just want to put out there that that is important, and I think we need to start thinking about it now because we do need to yeah. capitalize this significantly. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Um, well, we we've talked about funding off and on, just in general. But I don't know if you've given any. So that's a. Um, General fund million dollars goes to the you know loan fund. Have you given thoughts to any funding mechanism other than just a general fund allocation on an annual basis? No, I mean we can jump to my last slide, which is sort of the summary of, of resources necessary in terms of S213 is drafted. Um, with our recommended changes. And as I said, Hannah's got language that we're happy to, to share with the committee, although it may have even been submitted already that would capture all of these pieces. Um, but in either instance, there is a significant base need uh, within the agency to support implementation of either version of this bill. Either version, mm -hmm. your version or our version versus FAFS version. Correct. I'm all waiting for the <laughs> conversation here. Can <laughs> add an extra column to my table. I was like, let me look at the house version. Um, but just in terms of, of sort of staff within the agency, um, particularly in the river corridors pieces, Ross spoke to, there's also need for significant contracted support um, around the, the mapping components. Um, and then the recognizing uh, some additional capitalization or investment in safety as well. Um, and just want to be clear that, that there are more people needed when we get to a permitting program when it comes to river corridors that aren't fully reflected in, in either one of those budgets. Um, and maybe just some closing thoughts for me is that I, I really appreciate the intent of S213. Um, the importance of wetlands regulation and restoration, river corridor and floodplain protection and dam safety as the, the need to become more resilient and respond to, respond to the impacts of a changing climate feels really urgent in this moment. Um, this bill is with so many other pieces of legislation that are currently under consideration here is full of really important ideas and good intentions. And frankly, if resources were no constraint, a lot of things we would love to do. Um, however, we are resource constrained um, and our staff, my staff are stretched really thin right now with, with no capacity um, as drafted. Um, and as you've heard from the experts in my shop, S213 is unmanageable. Um, and I hope you will take seriously that feedback. Uh, I brought you a set of recommendations here as a to a more stepwise approach that supports Vermonters and becoming true partners in this work. Um, and that still requires a, a significant investment of resources. Um, and maybe to go full medical, Senator Bray, with, with your opening remarks, as you work towards the version of a bill that you'll ultimately vote, vote out of committee, I implore you to do so with a clear understanding of the actual resources that General Assembly, not this committee, but the General Assembly is prepared to commit to supporting this work and match the scope to that reality um, as opposed to the resources you wish for a bill. Well, you know, I'm thinking a lot with the committee, with you and the committee, but, um, uh, you know, maybe the bill should say contingent upon availability of funding. Just see it in the from the get uh, so that we're we're clear. Thank you. Um, and so the um, the in our proposal, uh, can it, uh, can you explain again the the total there? Three million base and seven million to one time. What those two are? So the, the, they come from. 
Well, so as envisioned here, it would be a general fund ask. We haven't yeah. proposed any alternate source of funding. Um, of that, about $750,000. These are just rough yeah. round numbers yeah. for staff costs. We budget at $150,000 a staff person. Yeah. Um, so this would be funding sufficient for five new FTEs uh, spread across wetlands, flood hazard areas, and river corridors, as well as a, a larger investment um, too much to your point, Senator Watson, more on the, the grant side of the um, dam safety needs to ensure that we are able to deal with all poor condition facilities. Um, in addition, so those are base, those are annual needs. And then in addition to that, um, as Ross spoke to, there's some significant mapping needs around river corridors. And this would be uh, an investment of one-time funds in creating those maps. Okay. So are these one time though going to be ongoing? Well, that's the base. So, you know, I think we're gonna to need to do mapping. I mean, like it's a, a phase. Oh, so so a whole series of mapping. I guess I would say it's a phased approach, yeah. right? And this is that $750,000, if we go back to it, reflects sort of the first phase of that work, this, this 24 to 26 work. I can't. Until we get to the other end of that, it's a little hard to suggest if there would be additional contracted or staff support needs other than knowing when we get to an expanded permitting program, we'll need more people to administer an expanded permitting program. I hear two things. I hear the secretary say, ask what resources would the legislature suggest be committed to this work? And as a member of the legislature, we're saying to the secretary, Madam Secretary, what resources is the administration willing to commit to this work? And when we make suggestions on what we might commit, we don't they don't seem to be welcome. So mm -hmm. we're saying to you, why don't you make some suggestions and see if we welcome them? But right now, we're and speaking right past each other. The people in Barry, the people in Montpelier are saying, what's what, what's the matter with these clowns? They're, they're just, they ask the other side a question and fold their hands and expect the other side to answer when they themselves won't answer. And I, that's for both. Yeah. Sides of this. This is not being critical of you. It's where what is causing the failure of us to come to the resources that we would be willing to commit. Where's the holdup? But there are other competing priorities that sit outside of the agency of natural resources that are consuming the capacity within the general fund of the state of Vermont. We have made investments in the pieces that I have advocated for with the governor, including a base appropriation for wetlands mapping, uh, the million dollars to capitalize the state revolving fund, the creating full-time positions in the dam safety program. Um, and to the extent there are priorities that go beyond that, I'm saying I support them. I have the luxury of focusing on one piece of the overall work of state government as does this committee, and there are going to be competing demands for those finite dollars, and they would need to come at the expense of something else. Well, that's well, not, they are I, already. I, I, that's a okay. gentle lot. And yeah. way of saying, uh, but a long way of saying the problem that we look at, which is we both talk about how willing they are to work with the money available, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But no one's come over it. No. Well, it's a, uh, it's, it's a past. I don't know where the, it's a past to. It does deal with, uh, let's say, I just, well, to just get a finer beat on what you're talking about, can we go back to your final slide and say, and ask of the, um, the total that's down to 3 million base, 751 time. How many of those things are in the government, the governor's? Yes, that's exactly. Yeah. None of these things are in the government. Uh, and 
And then outside this is the one million revolving loan fund, and that is addressed. Correct. Yeah. Along with the money for wetlands mapping that I think was prescribed by your bill that I would argue is already underway and on its way to be completed. Yeah. Thank you, Chair Bernay. Um, that was my exact question was, I haven't seen your budget yet. I don't know if it's been sent to us from ANR or if we when we received that, um, but I'd love to see that when it's available, if it's done. It, it, yes, I mean, the okay. governor's budget dropped last week, so. Okay, I didn't get that. I didn't get the budget. Um, like, it, it used to be, I thought we got copy of it. So, um, so that's a, yeah, I mean, generally we come into the committees of jurisdiction and provide a yeah. budget presentation. We we've been invited into the House Appropriations Committee, and to my knowledge, that's the only committee we've been asked to, to provide testimony on our budget. Can we ask them to come? Yeah, I think you can, uh, sure, we'll come back to budget. Okay. Yeah, the other thing is, um, I think the tradition has changed lately. We didn't have budget books when we came out of yeah. the budget address, and I know there's an online available budget summary, which I downloaded, but I don't know that it got distributed automatically for no. everyone. So may I request that as an individual member? Is that something I'm allowed to request? It's all on the JFO website or the finance and management website. So I should instead ask legislative print. I mean, I'm, print I'm, I'm happy form. to uh, just some answer. I could email you a link. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I, I always love when we got the transportation budget book because I like to go through and I bring it with me to public meetings when people ask questions. Yes. Oh, so okay. it is helpful to have a printed copy. I'm happy to pay for a printed copy, <laughs> I guess is what I'm saying, but we used to get one. So that's but that's beyond the point. The point of the question is I don't know what's in your budget. And is there any what is in your budget? What is the comparison for this chart? Is there I would say, like, if I added another column here, it would say in wetlands that we are still drawing down the balance of $250,000 worth of one-time money coupled with a $100,000 increase to our base to deal with mapping. Um, and that is a dam safety space. In the, the So that $100,000 will be part of the FY25 budget in addition to having been part of the 24 and 23 budget. So that is the same? The top line is the same? As for your A and R changes, is what you're telling me. You have grant funding for the wetland piece. It's not grant funding; it's state general fund. Oh, I apologize. Could you explain it again, then? Yes. So what I was saying is, if you're looking for where we have resources that have been placed into the budget to get at the priorities identified by this bill, I would argue on the wetland space we're doing the, much of the mapping work envisioned by the bill using resources that were provided by the governor and general assembly i think starting in fy 23. okay so the two hundred and fifty thousand you just referenced was fy 23 one FY time 23. at the same time we received a one hundred thousand dollar increase in our base appropriation in our office of waters and that is being used to fund the mapping on an ongoing basis okay so you the person who is in the wetlands department remains temporary and then they go away like there, is, when, there is no staff. This is contracted support that we're using to perform the mapping. That one MTE is a reflection of trying to suggest a compromise with what the committee has laid out in terms of doing this very close at hand mitigation, some fairly extensive reporting obligations. Um, and I think assuming we would have some stewardship liabilities, we downsized that to just focus on the, the reporting and uh, monitoring obligations. As I indicated in my remarks, I would not put that wetlands position as a priority compared to the other things shown on this chart. So currently there is no staff person doing this work now. It is a consultant. Is that the mapping work? We have. I, yeah, I'm just, I'm truly just asking questions because I want to understand. So we have a pro we have program staff in the wetlands division that are responsible for administering the regulatory program, including in instances where there are permitting impacts to wetlands to direct them to the in loop fee mitigation program for those impacts to wetlands that cannot be avoided or otherwise minimized. We've got that. And we have staff in the Department of Fish and Wildlife whose job is to do wetland restoration and conservation. And you contract out the mapping. mapping piece. Correct. And what is the contract amount for the mapping? And where would I find that in your budget? 
I don't know what the contract amount is for the mapping. Uh, and you would need to get way deep in the weeds of our budget. Like, yeah, that's not the below the Office of Waters. And pre I mean, if you want to get into it, we can go line by line. This is important. It's a three hundred million dollar budget. Yeah, it's important stuff. Okay, so I would love to understand because if you don't need to have a consultant, but you can have a staff person do this or more staff people, that seems like a long term investment versus. I think the consultant is a frankly we determined it's a more efficient way to go about this work because once we get through this initial mapping, we had a fairly significant slug of updates that were required, and the maintenance of effort is much lower. So it doesn't necessarily make sense to staff up while we improve our admittedly aged and inaccurate maps. Once we get them all up to kind of a current standard, the maintenance of them should be a lower cost effort than what it took to get them there, which is what we're in the middle of. Okay. Yeah, I guess I'd like to understand it more. So I won't dig any deeper on this question, but if I could just ask one additional. Sure, but like, I think it'll be helpful for us to get the link to the details so we yeah. the we can, we can start from shared information yes. as opposed to fishing. Bingo. Is there a way we can get that? Like you could make this chart and show us what the governor's budget is currently with it? Like we can get this slide. So there is nothing on this slide that's reflected in the governor's budget. I would have to add another column yeah. that indicates where the governor's, the governor's budget is making investments related to, in particular, wetlands and dam safe. Yes, and you're making a very compelling point that you're already doing the work. It's so, not the work. Great. So I would love to know what the, you just told me a consultant is doing that now. That's new information to me. If I had that and I can point to it, my constituents come to me and say, why the heck is the state doing this? That would be very helpful. Does that make sense? Like, am I, okay. I'm not trying to argue that you are making a wrong or right decision. I'm trying to explain to you that it is very tedious and hard for us to make a case for the state not funding something when people show up at meetings and tell us that they feel in danger. And we don't have a, a thing to point to that says the state is doing this. So if you're able to do that, it would be very helpful um, and it would make me less likely to be as forceful in my statements that the state is not doing it. Thank you. And my only other question on the dam safety piece is what is in the dam, what's the dam safety amount? Is it, because you have, you don't have the staff broken out here. And I've seen a few different presentations with different examples of temporary staff. We can provide sort of the current staffing levels for each one of these programmatic areas. This is specifically the plus up required to address the scope of the bill. It does not reflect the work already ongoing in the agency and part of our base budget. Okay, so you don't have the temporary staff in your changes becoming full time. That's not what the two point five million is. No, that 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 is to invest in in construction essentially. The um, create moving those two limited service positions to full time is essentially budget neutral. Yeah, that's what I was understanding. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And you was saying for thank you. So thank you for um, you know, to you and your staff for yes. Um, we reviewed the proposal, coming back with a, another way to work on the same body of work, um, and we'll communicate testimony. Uh, the, my goal for our committee is that we will build a vote on the week from this Friday. So we're going to be down into the black and white between the four corners of the page face. Do you have a, a, a strike ball or markup? Hannah, did that? Do you have that? I, or? I can mail that to you. Um, this morning, so you have okay. um, the version. We can give you what is the red line version, yeah. um, but we gave you what our alternative was because it is the actual language versus it gets as you're sure. pretty messy. Yes, yeah, sorry. So I'll give that to you separately. Okay, great. Good. Thank you very much. Make sure we will post it on our web page and um, distribute to committee members. Um, so, committee, we we are gonna. Um, take more chance going starting at 11 30. And since we've been churning right along, why don't we take a five minute sure. break and so then you come back to make sure we start by 11 30 because we're going to run time is going to be tight. We have some uh, committee bills to vote out, and that's recognize the great work that Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department is doing 
um, restoring wetlands and conserving wetlands on the Lake Champlain Basin. But this is related to development and um, net gain is related, so it's that two to one mitigation ratio for impacts. And it's looking ideally to restore the function on site of the wetland or within the watershed, that Huffgate watershed that I spoke to earlier. So that's really important. And it does, it, I don't think it's as, it, it does include an in lieu fee piece. So there's already in lieu fee. It shouldn't change the permitting time um, piece because the 5,000 square foot threshold is a threshold we worked with Laura LaPierre on. Um, she's the head of the Vermont Wetlands Program. So right now that is the threshold they use. So the permitting really shouldn't need to be updated. Um, so that being said, I'll go into this timeline. The first piece of the timeline is the wetlands reporting. And Secretary Moore did speak to the reporting. So the reporting, the first report would be due April 3rd, 30th, 2025. Um, that's the lower red bar. And that reporting, I certainly appreciate her comment to align that with the EPA reporting. I don't see a problem with that. I think that makes complete sense. Um, this reporting is more significant um, than the EPA requirements, so it does require additional detail, but I fully support um, aligning that with the EPA. Moving on, the rulemaking timeline would be July 1st, 2025. So that's amending the rules to clarify that net gain policy, that statewide policy of net gain that we currently don't have. Followed, following that, in 2026, January 1st, um, the Vermont Significant Wetlands Mapping Update. So that would be the first one, and then it would occur annually thereafter. And I appreciate, Secretary, just a note about the mapping piece. I appreciate Secretary Moore's comment about the mapping. Um, in fact, when we first wrote this bill as H30, the wetland map that was before the governor's budget had addressed some of the mapping piece so yes some of this mapping is happening now and that's really exciting what but this map this requires an additional amount of tracking and alignment so yes we're requiring national wetlands inventory mapping for the whole state and as you could see there's a contract already in place for that work to be done by 2025 that's the last thing in my timeline is that January 1st, um, 2030, um, NWI mapping update. So that, and I'm switching back and forth on the mapping here because they're tied together a bit. But so, so yeah, this bill and this policy proposes more than that because it's actually requiring that mapping to then be updated every five years concurrently with the basin plan. And I think that's really important because it's, it's when we have Wetlands change, so wetland delineations need to be updated every five years. They're, they can be very ephemeral. And when we don't have accurate information, mistakes happen. Well, why that just happened? Uh, Judy, sorry. It just looks like it's back on. Yeah. Oh, I don't think I did. Did you touch anything? No, I don't think you did. It just it was just a little bit. You just have to. I don't know why you have to be. You're in the room. It looks like your screen. Yeah, turned. it's coming back. I think it just just the computer decides to So that NWI plus mapping um, goes above and beyond what is currently happening, in that we have those updates continuing into the future on a five-year basis. Um, and then related to that, the Vermont Significant Wetlands Inventory Mapping will be updated annually. So, and that includes more than just the NWI plus mapping that's happening across the state. And you saw the time frame in the slide that um, Secretary Moore proposed. But it also includes um, municipal mapping. So certain towns have conservation commissions that have contracted consultants to do um, even a, like a, a more detailed wetland mapping within that town. So those would be brought in. Delineations that are subject to permitting would also be brought in. So we're requiring that Vermont significant wetland and the advisory layer to be updated annually as new information comes up. 
So it's just um, a higher level of tracking and accountability. <clears throat> and I think with that, I don't have, I'm just wanting to make sure I address everything. Oh, the public notice, there was a comment made um, from Secretary more about the public notice piece. I think um, that public notice is important, but happy to look into that that requirement if it's too laborious, the public notice piece for the wellness change, that's fine. And we support the, the need for the additional staff. I think it's really great to have more staff within the wetlands program, and this is more work. We recognize that, and I think it's really important work. Um, we need to recognize the important value wetlands provide to society at large and invest, invest in that resilience. So with that, I don't have any more comments. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Um, move to the notes. How much time do you have? Uh, two minutes. Oh, okay, great. It's a little bit. Your schedule is the most discussed. I think <laughs> might be back on. That's not true. We did have good things. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Good morning again. Good morning. Uh, for the record, Laura announced Director of External Affairs with the Nature Conservancy in Zambat. Um, I tried to take as many legible notes for myself during testimony to respond to, so I'll try my best now, but do want to acknowledge that it will be really helpful probably for all three of us to see the redline version so we can understand the right. specifics of what's being proposed to respond yeah. to, yeah. and then we can do that. Great. And so you know, don't feel rushed to be getting through all of it. I, I know that we just heard a whole long presentation, and you will be will provide time for you know a thorough response and um but as soon as we have the red line as well as the cleaning proposal of their language sort of drafted from scratch we'll have full room on that that's great that would be really helpful for us um so i think i'll start for, with um areas of strong agreement with what i just heard um and start again with the commendable work of the state employees uh, that do the work that is that has been described over the course of several weeks of testimony in S213. Uh, having been one of them, I worked deeply with Rebecca and Rob in the trenches following disasters, and it is a significant time burden and workload that is put on, on agency staff every time these disasters happen. To your question earlier, Senator White, uh, the disasters are happening on like 1.4 to 1.6 flood flood related disasters. That doesn't account for like wind and snow related damages, which we do get disasters occasionally annually. Not that that's a we can expect that every year, but that is the historic uh, at least this this century what we can, what we've received each year. Uh, I also agree that whatever is recommended or proposed in S two thirteen does need to carry the appropriate appropriations yeah. so that these staff who are already overburdened are not asked to do even more with less. Um, I really feel strongly, again, in my past testimony, I said that I that Vermonters' lives, homes, schools, businesses, roads, depend on this, that they are appropriately appropriate uh, to carry forward of this um, increased regulation. As do the taxpayers of Vermont. You've heard me say several times over that flood-related disasters are costing Vermonters tens of millions of dollars annually to recover from this. And as you discuss appropriations and as you look through the governor's budget, year over year, we keep pouring more and more money into the Vermont buyout program. That buyout program is a necessary tool to help flood damaged homes and homeowners in Vermont, but it also is not a sustainable solution. More than 10,000 homes in the floodplain. More keep getting built each year because we are allowing development in these high hazard areas. So at some point in time, we need to recognize that conservation is critical. I work at the Nature Conservancy. I understand that conservation in the absence of regulation is insufficient when it comes to our flooding problem. Um, part of the reason why capacity is so challenged um, is because we haven't changed our regulation. Because we have so much damage every time, 
staff and DEC reverse programs have to go out and respond to help municipalities work with the regional planning commissions from whom we've heard several times over um, kind of navigate this. If there were fewer damages, if we stopped building in these areas, there would be significantly reduced tax care burden and fast needs. Let's see here. Um, I heard a quote from the secretary that this would be an extensive undertaking. Yeah, it is. And yet we are currently asking our towns to taste this on. This is an expensive undertaking that they are currently trying to navigate. And you heard from the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, you heard from the regional planning commissions that they are not doing it well. They are not resourced appropriately. Uh, they do not have the technical expertise, nor the time, nor the political will, nor the social capital, et cetera, to really navigate this well. So that extensive undertaking is falling on all of our towns and our volunteer town staff. Can you remember, I, I'm trying to remember, um, Tim Brady was in, and I think he, uh, I'm not trying to feed a line. I'm just trying to remember because I think I heard the Secretary come up potential for pushback of the LCT yeah. and municipality. But the thing that stuck with me a little bit from Mr. Brady being well said was he said, I don't usually ever say this, but I think that we're looking for um, a, a larger role on the part of the state to manage the area. Yeah, his testimony, he supported this portion of the bill. I don't As Dracula. Yeah. And I think he called it, and I know you had a response to it, Senator Watson, so maybe you can remember, but I think he called it the silent or free labor of our towns, mm -hmm. the small and other towns that they go to their 40 hours a week job, they come home at night, they go to their volunteer meeting, and they come home and try to figure out what they do with all that information between like kids' bedtimes or 9 p.m. and midnight or whatever that is. Five to nine. But five to nine. Yeah. Yes, yeah, exactly. Um, oh, I've said before that we have yeah. tried as a state of oh, wage that it is wage that wage wage that, that was yes, that was a response. Yeah. I've said in previous testimony that we tried extensively to use that word again to incentivize towns to regulate their river borders. We have tried very hard uh, through many different mechanisms, and we are plateaued at about 10 to 12 percent of towns that have done this, and that speaks to just those towns that have adopted them, not that those that are enforcing them well and actually protecting those areas from development and future damage. So at what point in time do we say the incentives are no longer working, we need to switch to a regulatory? Again, the part of the bill that I keep, I mean, what I think about with respect to this part of the bill specifically, though it is definitely pervasive in the wetlands and dams parts too, are the, the four parts, the public safety, the cost of these damages, the municipal burden that we currently have them carry, and the natural resource protection itself. Hearing the recommendations, but again, not seeing them necessarily, so trying to read between the lines, uh, I think it's fair to say that the groups that have been working on this and give her testimony from before, at least from the environmental side, would agree and acknowledge when you see 20 FTEs for a floodplain program, that is huge. And the floodplain program is very different from river borders. It has a federal agency involved in it. Uh, it carries with the code for federal regulations, EFR, all sorts of issues and needs to meet, I think, along the way. So if we are going to phase this, I think I heard phase several times over, I think it would be acceptable on our end to really do the work on the floodplain side and take the time to do that. The floodplains are, again, what I think our 20% problem. That's where 20% our damages are happening. Our river corridors cannot wait. They are an 80% problem. That needs to happen maybe as quickly as the slide behind me says. I don't know, I would I would rely heavily on the person behind me to say if that's even realistic. Um, but it, we we feel strongly that again, this is a this is a resource, uh, a hazard area, a cost to Vermont taxpayers that cannot wait until 2030. Um, and again, these aren't new ideas. River corridor protections are recommended in state plan after state plan, year after year after year, exactly as is this exact thing is in the climate action plan. Um, and the state has a mitigation plan and a TMDL plan, the Lake Champlain, and all the other plans that I've said before. Um, let's see, I saw on the slide, one slide that there was a four FTE recommendation with respect to the river corridors. 
that seems like a real steal when you think about how much money and how many damages and how much life safety is at risk in the river corridor section. 20, I think for floodplains, four for the river corridors, I think that would be an extremely wise investment by this committee, by the General Assembly. I agree to the outreach piece. If we as a state do not do that well, we are gonna have a lot of poorly permitted, unpermitted structures that have to go through lengthy uh, appeals process and it will be a nightmare. And so to do this well and to actually have the outcome that we expect, I do think that we should make sure that legislation would provide for that education and outreach moment. Um, uh, there was a resources needed table and I heard the secretary say I should have added a column and I would love the opportunity to add the public safety, cost damages, municipal burden, and natural resources columns to that table based on what I see proposed. Uh, and then finally, I'll, free to come back to the yeah, table. I'll come back to the table. I'll come back to the table. Those are great. Yeah. Uh, and then I'm going to close with the Chris Campanyism from Wyndham Regional Commission. He said several times over that rivers are inherently intermunicipal. What one town decides has direct impacts on their up, but especially downstream communities. I cannot think of a better opportunity or greater need for state level control, regulation, technical expertise of a river corridor or of a resource of a place in a state uh, than this one. So um, I will read that red line edit and either come back invited for a referral testimony or submit it to you all. Great. Thank you Thanks. for your first snapshot testimony. I asked Mr. Halberger if he could come and then we'll pick up at our next meeting because we only have three minutes left and we have some housekeeping we have to do with moving. So thank you everyone on S213. Um, sure. We have uh, three bills that we need to move in order to get them forward and bring them back. So um, on Friday, I distributed the, the drafts we had. Um, and then yesterday, council were interested with our, our first cut at the next 50 language. So we'll have that or in the water in this room. And so I would switch the vice chair to move our committee bill so that we'll bring them back in here and continue working. Three of them are just to remind people housekeeping bills that I missed. Our September one draft of them, TC one, TC two, and ANR and the the Would you like to do these all in one motion or four motions? I have it as four seven. Okay, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so oh, we'll do all. Yeah, so. that's March right through one. Okay. Thank you. All right. So, uh, so we'll get that. Everyone will have hard copies of each thing. Maybe the other ones last right. week. Michael Grady did a update on one of them again. The reason I'm not worrying about the details of the language at the moment is because the point is to have them available. Yes, so that, that was what I wanted to just clarify as I consider taking a vote on all four of these. This is not a passage of the bill as final. This is just so we can, as a committee, right. actually review it as well. Right. The other way I look at this is it's a drafting deadline for committees. <laughs> so we're we're making our drafting deadline by putting these through. Then it all comes into the community and we can continue with the development. Right. Okay. okay, so I would move uh, that we, we're, uh, this is what we're finding figure for uh, or voting out to the floor. Introducing the committee bill. Oh, okay, thank you. So I move that we uh, introduce the committee bill and act related to miscellaneous changes related to the public utility commission. What's the draft? Just no. It's. Well, I don't know. I'm on the sheet. Oh, it's okay. 064. Okay, 064. Right. Um, any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay. Five, zero, zero. Thank you. You ready, please? Aye. Okay. Uh, all right, so I would uh, move that we. Uh, what did we say? Introduce the committee bill 
and act relating to changes to the clean key standard. You have she has all the numbers. I have all the numbers, but I don't know which one each number goes with. That's my only. This one's at yeah. every 50. It's, it would be one of these. Oh, thank you. Yeah. My eyes skip right over. Yeah. Oh, thank you. So that's that one. Okay. No, so that we should have done. Thanks. Okay. Right. Um, any committee discussion? Okay. All those in favor, please say no. Aye. Aye. One opposed. I would move that uh, we, excuse me, could you? Um, that we, move that we uh, introduce uh, the committee bill and act leading to the use of administrative use controls at contaminated sites. Okay. Um, any committee discussion? None. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Five zero zero. Uh, and I would move that we uh, introduce the committee bill and um, act related uh, related to the miscellaneous changes to Act Fifty. Any discussion? None. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Nay. Five zero zero. Thank you, everyone. Um, we'll see those back. They'll go to the floor. You'll hear me make a motion to refer them back to committee, and off we go. Thank you. With that, we are adjourned. <laughs>